Welcome to Be With The Word, and this is our weekly podcast where we reflect on the Sunday readings from a psychological perspective. This is the 20th Sunday in Ordinary Time, and we will be looking at these really interesting topics of the four essentials for how God can grant your heart's desire. And I'm Dr. Jerry Crete in Atlanta, Georgia, and I am so pleased to be here with my buddy, Dr. Peter Malinowski. How are you doing, Peter? I'm doing great. It is good to be with you, Dr. Jerry. It is good to be with all of our listeners and all of our viewers. We are in for a real treat today. These these readings are, you know, at first glance, maybe not so obvious what the psychology is, but once you get below the surface, they're incredibly rich. So it's a real blessing to be able to go through them today with you. Well, when we were talking about this before, you said the psychology of petitionary prayer, and I was fascinated by that, and I was really curious. I mean, I mean, sometimes I think we almost look down on petitionary prayer, like we're not supposed to. Right. Have- Right. I mean, I think that's that's how a lot of people feel, or or maybe not petitionary prayer for me. Right. Maybe we could pray for somebody else or we can pray for the church or we can pray for the pope or we can pray for, you know, the nation or something like that, but not for me. And um, and I think that there are so many hurdles that uh, can happen in the psychological realm that get in the way of people praying. There's other types of impediments. There's moral impediments. There's spiritual impediments. There can be other types of things that get in the way. We're really focusing on the psycho- psychological ones. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, we have a great gospel today. This is the one with the Canaanite woman. And we have Jesus in a, uh, who came to, well, sorry, the Canaanite woman came to Jesus because of her daughter, who right. seems to have had a demon and some sickness. And she was absolutely determined for Jesus to help. But we also learn, right, that Jesus and the apostles were outside of Jewish territory for the only time, I think, recorded in the Gospels, right? They were in Tyre and Sidon, in the region of Tyre and Sidon. And just a quick reminder, check out Hear the Word, which is the sister podcast. You can hear the entire Gospel there along with the rest of the readings. Hear the Word is our sister podcast. It's just Dr. Jerry and I reading the readings to you. And it's also on YouTube and it's on uh, Spotify if you want to listen to it in podcast form. Also Apple Podcasts, Google Play, all of that. Uh, So check that out. But yeah, we're going to review how Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Now Tyre and Sidon are northwest of Galilee. They're on the coast. They're sea, they're, they're port cities in, on the Mediterranean. And in the time of the first century, these were really rich, bustling areas. They were occupied by the Romans too. The Romans had to reach all the way up there. Um, but it's interesting because they were not considered, you know, they were not considered friendly to the, um, to the, uh, to the, to the Jews, to the Hebrews. So, there's some speculations about why Jesus retired. Uh, the most prominent one being that he really just wanted some time to form his disciples. He really wanted it to be like a retreat where he sat down with this, his disciples in a very small group and really worked with them to help them understand, you know, the coming of the kingdom of God. You know, and it seems like, okay, just from, I love it that we're in depth studying these readings every week because it really helps me. Because it feels like for the last several weeks, Jesus has been desperately trying to get some time with <laughs> <laughs> disciples and all. Right. He wants a bit of peace. Right. And like he never, the poor guy, he never. <laughs> and even here, he goes somewhere where you would, the Jewish, the Jews probably would have followed him, right? They wouldn't go outside of Jewish. Territory. Right, right. And he probably, you would have thought maybe he wouldn't be well known. And meanwhile, here he is being you know, harassed. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Aren't the Canaanites like the traditional enemy of the Jews? Like, Yes, enemies, right? You know, in fact, you know, originally you see it in uh, Exodus. They were they're coming out of Egypt into the land of Canaan, right, to take it over, right? So there's a long standing goes back through centuries. Uh, Sidon actually is the oldest son of Canaan. We learn this in um, in Genesis 10, chapter 10. And so, you know, this was an area that, um, you know, that was was populated by folks that were not really closely connected to to the to the Israelites. And, yeah, I think that's exactly right. It, in order to avoid the crowds. Right. Why not go to some really far flung place where there's a lot of hostility towards uh, towards Jews? You might get a little peace and quiet there. 
but it wasn't to be. But the, yeah, this woman shows up. Right. And who's upset? It's the disciples, right? They're saying, hey, we got to get rid of her, right? We need to, to we need to just get this late because they may want a peace and quiet too and a chance to be with Jesus, right? Without all of the crowds. I and mean, they were really looking forward to this time away. They were really looking forward to this retreat, to being really nourished spiritually. And here comes like a, like a, like a gadfly, this pestering, this pestering Syrophoenician woman, this Canaanite woman, you know, that's, that's coming to bother them. Right. Yeah. 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 And so she cares about her daughter. Apparently right. her daughter had some kind of demon, right? right. Which is hard to, completely always understand what that is exactly and presumably an illness along with it of some kind and she's petitioning jesus to save her daughter and i actually thought the words she used were kind of powerful like she said have pity on me lord son of david (laughs) which is an interesting thing to for a syrophoenician woman for a canaanite woman to refer to jesus as the son of david yeah. Right. That's a really fascinating title. Right. To uh, to think about her using. Now, you got to remember Tyre and Sidon. These were bustling cosmopolitan, cosmopolitan metropolitan areas. They aren't now. Now they're really small. But back in those days, you know, in port cities, there was a lot of like exchange of information, a lot of people coming and going. Right. Very, um, mm-hmm. very much centers of, um, of of information, of news, of messages coming back and forth. So she may have heard she had to have heard somehow about this Jesus of Nazareth. Right. Um, and so. So, yeah, it's not clear what she knew, uh, but it is clear that she was animated by faith. That she had the grace of faith, and um, and so it, you know, saying "Son of David," acknowledging him as a king, like mm-hmm. king of the Jews, like saying "Son of David." Right. That's that's loaded, right? And it's also recognizing, you know, his his lineage, right, which is entirely Jewish, right? Um, so. So it's an interest. It's just fascinating. I don't quite, I don't quite understand what all the psychological implications of that would be, but I mean, it's certainly something that's le- leapt out, right? I so I thought it would be psychological in the sense of he's having to have humility, right? Like, isn't right. She having to, you know, because she's not a Jew, so right. for her to do that is kind of putting herself second, right? Her. Well, we're going to get really into her humility here in a little bit too. So. Um, so what did the, what did the disciples say? Send her away for she keeps calling out after us. And Jesus seems to agree with them, right? Cause what's the next line? He says, you know, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Right. So, but she's also, he's also echoing a little bit of hers, right? The house of Israel, son of David, right? She, you know, they're on the same page there. I think, I think Jesus is, playing a little bit here <laughs> he's something like that is like a firm dogmatic statement for all time or anything right i right. think he's having a little fun right he's I, I and we don't know because we it's like we're getting some text or getting an email we don't always know the tone right but i think he's playing he's also teaching his disciples through this well i was sent only for the last sheep of the house of israel right right, right. and yet this woman says uh, does homage and says, Lord, help me. Right. It's an invitation, right? St. John Vianney in, in his in his commentary talks about how this really stretches us. So when God initially seems to say no, mm-hmm. uh, it stretches us to increase you know, the abundance of our desire, right? So that God can actually give us in greater measure what we're asking for. Right. So there is a, there is a, there, I think there's playfulness here. I certainly think there's some, some, uh, some, some tension and banter back and forth. It's serious though. It's not lighthearted, but there is also some play, right? She actually is able to maintain, she's actually able to maintain uh, almost like what I would say is maybe a sense of humor. And she tracks very closely to what Jesus is saying. She's listening to him and she's actually taking his statement. And turning it back around because, you know, um, wait, wait, because wait, that, that. Well, we're getting ahead of ourselves, right? A little bit. Because yeah. doesn't Jesus say almost what seems like could be the most condemning line in all right. scripture, right? right? It's not right to take the food of the children and throw it to the dogs. That's right. <laughs> how, he, how he delivered that line. Right. 
because if it was harsh, it would be really harsh. But you well, have to wonder if he's being a bit playful and he's seeing her and he's seeing the reaction of the disciples and he's what he's letting this unfold. Right. Is there a twinkle in his eye? Maybe there's not. Maybe there is. But what we do know is that he knows exactly where she's at and he knows what she can take. Right. Mm-hmm. And she was able to take that line because um, because basically you could interpret that as um as saying uh, your request is uh, inappropriate, you right. know your request is ill-advised. It's it's not it's not really what you should be asking for. I'm not here for you. I'm not here for your daughter. But animated by faith, she knows. She has confidence in him. And what does she do? She merely decides to. She takes this. She takes this analogy, right? She takes this metaphor and she runs with it. Right. Because she said, yeah, please, Lord, even the dogs eat the scraps that fall from the table of their masters. Now, okay, I know you were preparing for today. Okay. <laughs> so you, you have it together better than me, maybe. But I did do a little research just because I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, Jerry. Go the for it. The word that was used here for dogs is cuneria, which does not imply unclean scavengers which is what most dogs were in the ancient world right right uh, they were it, that would have been like the worst insult in the world would be to call somebody a dog basically right. that's contemptuous that's right an insult but the word is cuneria right which means a small pet okay Greek. so right. for her to say even the dogs eat the scrap because we're not talking about a scavenger out there just scavenging we're right. talking about a pet right Right. So I felt like there that added that understanding added to the playfulness of this exchange. If that helped. Yeah, these and these are dogs that have a place in the house too, right? These are not just in, invaders or intruders, right? So there's there's a softening there that we might not appreciate in the in the English um, in the English translations that we have. And uh, and, and then because it could uh, feel like a, a giant rebuke too. Like it's right. ten, there's, it's on the edge. I feel like yeah. the message is on the edge. The this is dicey stuff, you know. And a lot of times, I think this stuff gets sort of, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, glossed over, you know, in homilies. Like this is hard language, and I think we really need to engage with it, you know, not just uh, not just uh, skip over it or ignore it. Because, yeah, and you have to understand that, you know, we talk about racism in our society today, right? If you go back to, uh, you go back to, uh, to these first century times in the, in the, in the Middle East, (laughs) racism was just a a granted fact of life. I mean, there wasn't any, there wasn't a lot of people saying, no, we should, we should treat, we should treat uh, Samaritans with dignity and respect. I mean, that's why the, 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 uh, the parable of the Good Samaritan was such a shocking thing you know, to hear, right, that the Samaritan would be cast in the role of the hero, right? That's just unthinkable, right? So yeah. there's all kinds of ethnic uh, rivalries, all kinds of rivalries there. What's fascinating, though, still, even that, what what I love about the Church's wisdom and the lectionary and everything else is this first reading from Isaiah doesn't seem like it all, 100% like it fits with some of the other stuff we read, because we do read about the battles and the wars and the Canaanites and how they had to take over that area and all this stuff that was going on. And yet here in Isaiah, we have, thus says the Lord saying, you know, um, the foreigners, foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, loving the name of the Lord and becoming the servants like the, they will and hold to my covenant that I will bring to them to my holy mountain. The holy mountain is where, you experience God. God. Yeah. Absolutely. Moses experience God in the holy mountain, like and and make and make joyful in my house of prayer. And that they'll their their offerings will be acceptable. Like Whoa. Isaiah's pretty radical here. That is extremely radical. Isaiah is really and it's not Isaiah's words per se, right? He says, thus says the Lord. He's prophesying, right? He is he is teaching from the mouth of God. Um, and so, uh, you know, but those, those rivalries were so ingrained at the time that it can be easy to lose track 
you know, it's easy to lose track of those things. And then, of course, we have the second reading from St. Paul, oh, yeah. um, and that's from Romans, where, you know, St. Paul was the was the apostle to the Gentiles, right? So he's he's the one kind of tasked with going out to all of these uh, these places. And he went to Tyre and Sidon. But he you know? was torn. You can see how in these right. this reading and the ones before how torn he was because he's Jewish. And he right. loves the Jewish people. Right. And yet he's bringing the message to the Gentiles and he's trying to reconcile the fact that the covenant is shifting. How can, you know, this idea of, of the uh, grafting this, well, he doesn't mention it in this reading, but I, I read further because I couldn't help it. Whenever it said 11, 13 to 15, and then it goes 29 to 32, I'm like, I want to know what's between. <laughs> Sorry, I can't help it. That's Pitch's intention, but I, I have to know. And so there was a lot of the talk about grafting to the and, and Peter. This is your area more than it's my right, it, right, right. Horticulture, but it, <laughs> he was describing something that doesn't make a lot of sense from a horticultural perspective, which is that the um, new that the old could be the old the pure. Uh, olive, whatever vine could be grafted to the new one, right? And that didn't make sense, and yet it's kind of what's happening that the Jews could be saved through Christ and through the covenant, but but they would have to be grafted into the new. They would have to be grafted, right? Because there's an entirely new covenant here, and one that's universal, right? One that's meant for all peoples, all nations. Yeah. And um, and if you if you think of salvation. In a spiritual sense, that's a lot easier to think about it than how a lot of Jews at the time were thinking about salvation, which was really, uh, you know, a messianic deliverance from the yoke of Roman, you know, Roman rule, Roman oppression. So, but, but they believe. I think what Paul is grappling with here is the fact that the Jews at the time, at least, may have believed or would have believed if they followed all the rules properly, that they right. would be saved because of that because of that and and his very weird and difficult to understand language for god delivered all to disobedience that he might have mercy upon all means in my mind means even the jews who follow the rules aren't actually ultimately saved without christ right as being saved by christ is about faith not about being a rule follower Right. It's about the relational connection. It's about love. It's about charity. It's about the spirit. It's not about the law. Yeah. Right. And that was something that the Pharisees, who were the dominant, you know, the dominant teachers at the time and strict observers of the law, were really inculcating the the, the population with. And a lot of the other people in the population just kind of gave up on it. Just so many laws, so many restrictions, so many guidelines. You, know, you can't keep up with it all because of how many, you know, how many there were. Right. So. So, but going back to, going back to the gospel, yeah. I mean, are you ready to go back to the gospel? Can we go back to the gospel? <laughs> All right. Probably too much. I'm sorry. But... No, no, no. Let's go back to the gospel. And I hear I'm, uh, essential things. Yeah. There are four, there's these four essential things, right? These four essential things to these four essentials for God to grant your heart's desire. And these were the four things that really leapt out at me. Um, one is number one. And so the other thing is we're going to go through the psychological and the main psychological impediments to each of these two. All right. So, so the first thing though, is to have a worthy request, hmm. right? So in this case, you know, the request was from the, from the, uh, the Canaanite woman to, for her daughter to be freed from these demons. Now we may differ a little on this. I think there was actual possession here. I'm not sure that there was mental illness. I think there was some kind of actual possession here, which could very well have happened because the, remember these were pagan cities, you know, there was all kinds of occult being practiced, all kinds of possibilities for, for, uh, you know, for, for possession to, to occur. So the first thing is a worthy request. The second thing is that, and, and she, this Canaanite woman gives us an entire example, very condensed of like perfection in petitionary prayer. So it's really important to take a look at it. The sec, so the second, first thing, worthy request. Second thing, confidence in Christ. She knows the good. She knows, she knows at this deep level that Jesus could perform the exorcism and that he could do it remotely. And she had absolute confidence in him. So that to me, like, was like right there. Now, did you want to comment on this stuff? Or you want me to run through the rest of the, the other two and then you come back? Because I, I was looking at this and we met together just real brief before and I had similar ones. I actually, worthy request makes total sense to me. I right. actually just framed it as love. 
I mean, he had true, she had love for her child and she wanted the good for her child, you know? And my understanding in the ancient world of demons would be that they, that there was a demon in everything in their minds and in, in illness was definitely a demon of doesn't mean there wasn't a possession. I, there could well be, but, but that they would have seen an illness as, as a demon. Mm. That's just how they would have seen it. So we don't know the details, but whatever was wrong with her clearly was a big problem. And she loved her child and wanted it relieved and was willing. And, and the next part you mentioned like this faith, Right? right, like she had faith that Christ could heal her child of what was wrong. Right, and she was adamant about that in a way that was remarkable for a woman who wasn't Jewish. Right, yeah, and 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 like, I my imagination of her is that she may have been fairly well off, um, that she may have been someone who was you know at least educated enough to be able to hear what was going on she might not have been but um but you know that uh you know that she she was heavily invested she she learned what she could about the christ from where she was right Mm -hmm. and then the third thing so the first one having a worthy request second confidence in christ the third is to stay engaged yes right to to stay with it stay with the relationship stay with the request I you know because indomitable go ahead persistence indomitable persistence now, yeah i have some mother i have clients some of my teens clients i have mothers who are like the canaanite women who <laughs> they're going to fight for whatever their kids need whether it's counseling or support or whatever it is they don't give up on their child right i think and that's a virtue i think it's a i think it's a parent parental virtue but man some mothers they have it down (laughs) well and and look what happened right so first time she's met with silence she gets no response right to her first to her first to her first entreaty and then the second one is an attempt to decline right so jesus attempts to decline he says look you know um and then she stays with it you know and 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 st- and remains engaged with him uses his language goes with the metaphor of the dogs right and says even the dogs uh even the pet dogs under the table get the scraps that fall right oh. so just really staying engaged and and it's not you know she is like speaking directly to him Right. This is a very personal encounter. It's not sort of just words sent off into the void. Yeah. Right. No, it's a very personal relational engagement with him. And um, yeah, I added something here that I thought was kind of interesting. And it, he says it earlier on that she does homage. I'm right. At the reading right now. For some reason, it's not jumping out at me. But oh, yeah. But the woman came and did. Jesus, Jesus homage, homage yeah. which to me I read as worship. I hope I got right. it right. And that's a little bit unique, don't you think? Like there's an aspect here that she is, she's worshiping him. She recognizes on some level who he really is. Who he really is. Which right. Is- and remember, whatever religion she was, this probably would not be tolerated by it. No. Like, you know, I mean, I didn't get into what were the what were the current religious pra- practices of the Canaanites, but we do know that they probably would not uh, appreciate Baal and all those kind of yeah activities. yeah that they, that they probably would not appreciate her doing homage to Jesus like no. this 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 Jewish man you're gonna bow down and give homage to, you're gonna worship this Jewish man like like you think about the risk that she's taking. You know, in terms of like this getting back to whoever her people are, right? Yeah. You know, you did you flip out and you're you're, you're talking to a Galilean I about this? Believe, I have to believe that when Jesus saw that, well, he already probably knew, but when he heard that homage, something clicked for him. Mm. It was different, and that's why it's a play. He's playing with her with these. He's not just condemned. He's not being harsh when he says about the lost sheep. Uh, or, or about the dogs, he's being like, he's seeing where this goes. It's, right. It's unusual. But even the homage doesn't turn him around right away because that's right before he says it's not right to take the food right. of the children and give it he's to the dogs. Right. He's playing with it. He wants right. to see the real faith get expressed. 
Now she comes back with, and this, if we have any children watching, right? Now, now she comes back with the magic word, right? She comes back with please, right? <laughs> she brings in the word please, right? right? Please, Lord. And, uh, you know, she's intensifying. So he's ratcheting it up, yeah. right, with the language and the metaphor of the dogs. And she's ratcheting it up, you know, with the dogs, but also with increasing the intensity of the entreaty. And you can feel, if you get into this passage, you imagine this scene, She, you can feel the emotion here. This isn't a dry you know, sort of intellectual exercise. This isn't just her reaching out with her intellect and her will. This is her reaching out with her heart, mm-hmm. you know, with her body. She's giving homage with her body, right? There's a, there's a, there's a body component to this. There's a heart component to this. There's an intellectual component to this because she prepared herself for this, right? And then there's, of course, the soul component, right? The faith, the confidence in God. So it's a whole person exchange a whole person experience here yeah it's a beautiful plea Mm -hmm. lord even the dogs eat the scraps but you know in other words you're you seem to be playing with me but seriously right i need you and And, your answer is beautiful and the answer and 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 i know who you are you can try to hide it's lord she says lord lord right Yeah. yeah and then he just ends the game right there and just says, Oh woman, great is your faith. Right. Right. And yeah. let it be done for you as you wish. And it's instant. It's not like wait three weeks, you know, um, allow six to eight weeks for delivery. You know, it's like, boom, right there. And this is one of the great compliments. Can you imagine like what it would be for Christ to say to you or to me, oh, Dr. Yeah. Jerry? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How great is your faith? Right. So, so I looked at and thought about like what are the psychological impediments to each of these four, each of these four uh, essentials for uh, petitionary prayer. What gets in the way psychologically? And so for the first one, um, the worthy request, um, we can we can ask for things that um, we may feel are certain that are good for us, but they aren't really. They can only be apparently good to us, right? So. Um, so that's where it's often helpful to say, um, if it be your will, Lord, right. To kind of cover it that way. In her case, you know, demon possession is objectively an evil thing. I mean, there's just no, no, and freedom from demon, demonic possession. And I actually believe it was demonic possession. I don't, I don't, cause they can identify when there are illnesses and they talk about, you know, different kinds of illnesses. I don't know, maybe a tire inside and they looked at it all as, as demon possession, but, but like that's a great thing to be freed from. So she had a worthy request. I think sometimes the things that really are our heart's desires, we might need some flexibility and some imagination to get outside the box, right? To be able to get outside of our box. So just to be open to what problems might exist with our request, especially if it's something that we want so passionately. That can happen in the area of romance, for example, um, to really desire a relationship with somebody that we're not seeing clearly. Right. So that's that's where I came up with that. I don't know if you have anything to chip in on that one in terms of love. Except okay. that, you know, she loved her child and it was a good thing and it wasn't self interested. Right. Other than obviously, you know, you you're you're somewhat self interested if it's your child. But right. she had gen I believe she had genuine love and right. wanted the good for her child and wanted this demon, you know, out of her child. So we're, we're talking about the purity of intentions here, you know, with that one. And then the second one, confidence in Christ. And the number one thing that gets in the way of this, and I'm doing a whole series on this in the Coronavirus Crisis Carpe Diem um, podcast that I do separately. I'm going to encourage people to check that out. But is that we default to our God images, right? We, we just assume that God is different than he really is. We have these ways, our God image is the way that we look at God in our bones. It's what we feel about God. It's about our subjective experience of who God is that is driven by our relational history, by our attachment history. And it can be, it's it's formed by our the contact that we've had with our parents, other, people's in, other people in authority and our other experiences. So it's kind of how we, make sense of God at an intuitive right brain level. 
And that often is very far removed from who God really is. And so, um, so a lot of my clinical practice and, um, and a much of my work right now in souls and hearts is all about God images. So I encourage people, if you're interested in that, to check out, uh, starting with episode 22 of Coronavirus Crisis Carpe Diem. That's also on uh, Apple Podcasts and Google Play and uh, Spotify. It's also on our website. There's a little section on it. So I really encourage people to check that out. But negative God images, if we just default to those, if we don't um, really try to hold on to who God really is in our prayer, we could uh, lack confidence. And we know that that's going uh, to impact our petitionary prayer and the results. So, yeah. No, wonderful. Yeah, check that out. Um, this woman's faith is rather incredible. Uh, yeah, she had confidence and she wasn't being deterred by any of it. You don't see, you don't see, <laughs> you don't see any of this phasing her. And she's encountering the living God face to face and being told that her request is inappropriate. And, you know, she stays with it. Like that is a model for us. Yeah. I love it. I absolutely. Love a model it. that is still humble, like even in her persistence. Right. Right. She's not coming in thinking she's all that. She's coming in knowing that she's not all that. She's just right. in need. Right. And she's not being snarky. Um, she's not being bitter. You know, she's persisting in that, in that, in that confidence. Hmm. And then the humility is the fourth one, right? That, or the, I'm sorry, the staying, so staying engaged is the third one. That's the one we got to talk about next, right? And here is where I think people tend to break things off because of a fear of rejection, right? The fear of rejection, right? She could have been really sensitive to rejection here. And uh, you know who knows what her relational history was like. Uh, most of us have had experiences of, you know, attachment injuries, if not, uh, you know, attachment-related traumas. She could have backed off, right? So the staying engaged, um, you know, this this uh, the staying engaged in the face of what looks like conflict, you know, wrestling with God, struggling with with Christ, you know, in this situation, we can we because of fear of rejection or fear of being ignored. Right. Um, because she was ignored, essentially, originally. Right? Not really ignored, but Christ came across as though he was ignoring her. The disciples certainly wanted to dismiss her. <laughs> right. She wasn't finding a friend among the 12. Right. That was yeah. speaking up for her that we would yeah. see in the gospel. I think that's a good, good description. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. So, so there's where we can see, you know, there's where we can see that fear of rejection, um, you know, impeding the staying engaged is a psychological impediment. And then the fourth one, um, the humility, you know, people will generally say that the issue is pride. Okay. You know, and it makes sense because pride is sort of the vice that is in opposition to humility or is, is in opposition to humility. But I would also say that, um, you know, shame can be really prominent here, right? The activation of shame can kick off psychologically all kinds of self-protective measures that would close us off, right, to, um, to, to further engagement. Um, and, you know, she could have given herself over potentially to an experience of shame. You know, she was just referred to as a dog, you know. Um, and she was... Definitely in the moment, but you know what, even before, like, I could imagine somebody thinking... If my child is, if I believe my child is possessed by a demon, and this is a guy who is not even like he's Jewish and he's probably going to reject me, I, I'm not even going to go there. Right. I I'm not even going to open the thing because there were probably position. Yeah, there were probably other people there than a similar situation. You know, at least with needs, right? It's not. I'm not imagining that Tyre and Sidon were like perfectly spiritually and psychologically healthy communities. Right. They weren't, you know. And she was the one that came out. She, and that's what's beautiful about her, is that she isn't full of pride, and she, right. she is able. If she's got shame, she's able to put it away, and just say, "Lord, help me. I am, yeah, and I'm willing to even." compare myself to dogs eating scraps at the table. Right. You'll only help me because I need you. Right. And, and she brought, cool. she brought the rawness of her, of her experience to him. Yeah. Like she, you know, she doubled down with the, uh, with the, you know, with the laying bare of her heart and revealing that heart's desire. Yeah. So, 
What a what a testimony and psychologically difficult to overcome. Like to be that transparent and to be that right. just vulnerable. Right. You know, we do therapy in a private. Uh, we do pr- therapy in a private one-on-one setting usually, or if we have a couple, just the couple and us. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't have like the friends of the therapist hanging around. You know, adding negative commentary and judging her negatively, you know, we don't have that, right? right? But she's, she's facing 12 men that have already staked out their position that, that she's a nuisance, right? So she's doing this. <laughs> Probably gone. I'm sorry. I, my faith is not that strong. Like <laughs> I'm here. These guys are jerks. Like they don't even want me. Right. Right. I've gone into that bundle of, I don't know. <laughs> patient. Right. Right. So, you know, this is, and who knows who else was there, right? I mean, I mean, there may have been other people there too. So she's, she is like, she's like, she's like laying it out there in a really raw, real way, you know, with humility and also probably some desperation. You know, I could imagine some desperation. Sometimes desperation makes up for a little bit of lack of humility, you know, it's like. I have a, a completely frivolous and silly uh, question. Okay. <laughs> If we had to give, she has no name. This woman she has no name. name. What would her name be? <laughs> well, I, 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 I'm not real familiar with the Canaanite language, but like the one that pops into my mind would be um, Fortituda. You know, like oh, that's how I think of her. You know, as a Fortituda. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, that's a good name. That sounds. Yeah. Wait, is that sounds very Latin? But that would yeah, be it's right. I don't know. It should have to, it would have to be Greek. I don't know my Greek yeah. name enough to come up with the Greek name. <laughs> yeah, it's something we should probably. If you're gonna do that, we should probably look it up beforehand because otherwise we look like, <laughs> through that like, year. like, was like we're lacking we're lacking linguistic expertise in ancient uh, ancient Mediterranean languages here. We totally admit it. So. Gina, let's give her Gina. Gina. <laughs> All right, I'm just so. So the other thing, though, that, that really struck me about this is that we don't have to be perfect in this petitionary prayer, right? She wasn't, she didn't have a formal introduction. She sort of came in in, in a way that, you know, may have smacked of some impropriety, right? Uh, 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 you know, remember when the Samaritan woman accosted Jesus at the well and how shocking that was to the disciples? This is the same kind of deal, right? Canaanite woman, Samarian woman or Samaritan woman, right? Same kind of deal. Like there's, there's no formal introductions. There was no butler announcing her arrival. You know, there wasn't any of that. She, you know, so this was all like, this is all very earthy, gritty, very untidy, right? And, uh, and very spontaneous. So the idea that we have to make these requests in any kind of a perfect way is I think, I think uh, disproved by this as well. So, you know, we don't even have to be Christian, you know, uh, this, this lady was not Jewish, right? She wasn't even of the appropriate, you know, uh, cast. So God hears the prayers of non-Christians. You know, we need to, we need as Christians to remember that too. Um, so alone other, like, you know, we get very much in our little silos, right? Right. Non-Catholics, right? Because sometimes you say non-Christians, right? A lot of people are like, uh, well, you're Orthodox, or oh, you're a Protestant, or you're this, right. right? And we get very, very narrow-minded in that a little bit, right? Um, not to say we shouldn't have beliefs and so on, but that yeah, we don't we don't want to like say that the, your you know that your which denomination you follow doesn't matter. It does matter what denomination you are, what faith you outside are. of all bounds because he's God. He's God, right? Exactly. So, so I'm going to really challenge our listeners and our viewers to look at these four elements of petitionary prayer, right? So the four elements, at least as I have them, are, you know, worthy requests, confidence in Christ, staying engaged, and then humility, all right? Those are the four. And then I'm going to invite you to look at, like, what psychological elements correspond to each of these that can get in the way all right so for a worthy request you know misunderstanding the request is there something unworthy about the request is there an element of vengeance in the request you know is there an element of jealousy or trying to get it one up on somebody in the request so purifying the intentions right looking if there's any psychological aspects to that second one confidence in christ right really looking at your god images taking a hard look at those. And we talked about that, I think it was in episode 29 in this program too. Uh, I think I think it was episode 29 where you could go back. It was on Trinity Sunday where we talk, where I talked about God images. Right? So okay. taking a look at your God images and what you default to. 
The third, staying engaged. And specifically here, psychologically, fear of rejection. How do you handle fear of rejection? And then the fourth one, humility. Like, how do you react when there's a potential for shame or shaming? Yeah. You know, what kind of self-protective mechanisms kick in? And once you find something, if you pray about this, once you find something, I'm going to ask you to take it to, to our Lord, take it to our lady in petitionary prayer, right? Actually practice with it, right? You're actually praying about the thing that you need in order to pray about the thing, right? You know, to pray for the, to pray for this, to pray for guidance, to pray for, um, to pray for healing, to pray for whatever it is you need to overcome that psychological impediment to that essential quality for petitionary prayer. Right. Wow. So good. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Peter. Well, thank you, Dr. Jerry. So, uh, yeah, it has been great to be here. I'm, give us feedback. Let us know if this is, you know, if this is, uh, this is helpful. What's not helpful about it? Is it, is it going too fast? Is it going too slow? Is it too complicated? Is it too simplistic? Whatever the feedback is, we'd love to hear from you about it. Yeah. Um, we let us know. Be with the word meaningful to you. So, yeah. and, and we've had a growing number of listeners and we just, especially new ones to just what your thoughts are. Um, we'll bring them in mm -hmm. if we can. By the way, didn't get mentioned, but if you haven't had a chance to go to Stacy Sumero's website and check out God's Adventure Awaits, there was a summit just a week ago, and I did a talk on God's, um, kind of a, a talk on uh, anxiety and discerning God's will for your life. And uh, if you use the promo code CRETE, C-R-E-T-E, you'll get a discount because now you have to pay for it. It was free for just that weekend. But there were 40 different talks, all on vocations from all kinds of great. Father Tim Gallagher was there. He's one of, he's somebody I really admire. And Cameron Frad, others, there were tons of other great speakers. So if you're interested, um, you know, take advantage of that. Um, uh, and, and anyway, so hope you enjoy that. And plus, we've made a little shout out on that to our, um, to our uh, course on uh, God's call and discerning a uh, vocation, which Dr. Mark Glafke and I uh, put together recently. So uh, if you haven't listened to that or, or haven't taken advantage of that course, or you know someone that is discerning their vocation, certainly direct them to our course. And check out soulsandhearts.com. Uh, share our stuff with people that you think might really be uh, able to take advantage of it. We are continuing to to do what we can to rise above the noise of the internet, but there is nothing better than a personal recommendation. So if you have a friend, if you have a relative, if you have a colleague that you think could really benefit from, from one of our shows or from some of our other things that we've got going on at Souls and Hearts, please, we really want you to, 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 to pass the word along. So if yeah. you do that, that'd be really great. All right. So, but thank you for listening all the way to this point uh, in our discussion. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. Until then, be still. Believe. Be loved. Be loved. Take good care. God bless you all.